This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique way. This is a show about science by scientists. Let's check out our team of hardcore nerds. I'm Phil Torres, and I'm an entomologist. Tonight, the frozen zoo. In a deep freeze, cells from the most endangered species on the planet, like the white rhino. Now, shades of Jurassic Park, and the frozen cells bring this animal back from extinction. Dr. Shinny Somara is a mechanical engineer. Tonight, she's inside a tornado. Find out what scientists are doing to help us survive these killer storms. Marita Davison is a biologist specializing in ecology and evolution. That's our team. Now let's do some science. Hey guys, welcome to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, and joining us today are Dr. Shinny Samara and Marita Davison. Now, guys, when I'm in the field doing my research, one of the big issues I'm working on is how to conserve our wildlife. I got the chance to go down to the San Diego Zoo, where they're doing it in a very inventive way. They're preserving dozens of endangered species in a separate zoo they have down there, but this zoo is frozen. So let's take a look. At the famous San Diego Zoo Safari Park lies a zoo within a zoo, whose fences and animals have been replaced with liquid nitrogen and cell cultures. This is San Diego's frozen zoo. That's right, zoo. It's not the one you grew up visiting, but one in which there are living cells from over a thousand species preserved and frozen, all to help and protect future generations of animals currently facing extinction. What was the genesis for creating the frozen zoo? The possibility to save cells allowed us to undertake research right from the beginning that was relevant to reproducing endangered species. Each cell of an individual is capable of producing the entire individual. Can you walk me through the process of freezing cells? We get a biopsy, a small piece of tissue. We can take those cells and treat them so they can be frozen and put it in suspended animation. You say suspended animation. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, when you take a living cell, you can then freeze it to a very, very low temperature, like the temperature of liquid nitrogen, and all cellular activity basically stops. And in their state of suspended animation, can be thawed and in 20 minutes be growing again. The notion of freezing and thawing cells is fascinating. And with Dr. Ryder's help, we gained a clearer perspective. This is the frozen zoo. The cells are in racks, in towers, in an inventory system here, and they are in the vapor of liquid nitrogen, 250 degrees below zero. You can look down now, because we've clarified it, and see the towers that hold the cells of the frozen zoo. They're the cells of over 10,000 individual animals. This isn't exactly your traditional zoo. Would you say the definition of zoo has changed with this type of technique? Well, zoos have greatly expanded their mission from menageries. They are now conservation organizations. The zoos of the future will have activities like preserving these kinds of samples as a core part of their mission. The cells of many endangered animals, like the giant panda and western lowland gorilla, are also kept at the frozen zoo. But none is both closer to extinction in Dr. Ryder's heart than the northern white rhino. They are amazing. As big as they are, I think they're more like ballerinas than anything else. And they are exquisite products of nature. What amazing animals a rhino is. There may be seven white rhinos left, but how many reproductive individuals are there? They're at the most four, and those are all very highly related. Inbred populations cannot survive as well as ones that have higher genetic diversity. And that's where the notion of genetic rescue can come in. The goal of genetic rescue is to restore an endangered species to full genetic health. With today's rapidly improving genetic technologies, the cells at the frozen zoo could be used to reproduce healthy offspring for these endangered populations. 
A revolutionary genetic development occurred in January when a team of Boston and Japanese researchers found a remarkable new and easy way of creating stem cells from mice. Stem cells are capable of becoming any cell type in the body, and this new discovery is promising. Well, it's huge. Nobody knows whether it's possible in the rhino, but if it could be done in the mouse, why not in the rhino? The hope is to transform stem cells from a northern white rhino into both egg and sperm cells to create a white rhino embryo. We would have to embryo transfer it into a surrogate. The surrogate would be southern white rhinos, which are more plentiful and which we have reproducing here at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. That is 1,800 acres of San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Within there are over 330 species of animals, half of which are protected, or worse, endangered. Rhinos everywhere have been hunted down because of the mistaken belief in the medicinal healing powers of the rhino horn. What do you think is going to happen? Without change from the current trajectory, they're doomed. The film Jurassic Park depicted the technological process of reviving an already extinct species and helped the viewing public imagine the possibilities of de-extinction science. But the science and research of reviving long-gone species is very real and very controversial, often raising more questions than answers. To enter that debate, we visited the paleogenetic lab of Dr. Beth Shapiro at the University of California at Santa Cruz. What is your research with ancient DNA aimed at? Ancient DNA is a technique that can be used to get genetic information from animals and plants that lived in the past. De-extinction. Do you think it's doable in the foreseeable future? I'm not sure that making a 100% exact replica of a genome of something will ever be possible. This is one of the reasons that people interested in de-extinction of the mammoth, for example, use recently developed genome editing techniques to make specific changes in the genomes of an animal that's still alive to make it look more like the genome of the animal that you're trying to de-extinct. What you would need to know are the places in the genome, say you were using an elephant, for example, the places in the elephant genome that differed from the mammoth genome, and then you would be able to have an elephant that has some of the characteristics of a mammoth, for example, tolerance to cold or longer hair. So tell me more about this genome editing. Is that possible? That is doable. That part is doable today. And the technology to do multiple changes at once is being developed as we speak. There's some people in science that say if a species has gone extinct, there's a reason for it. We should just let it be. How do you feel about that? If we have solved the problem that caused the extinction in the first place, then and only then can we begin to think about what the other consequences of bringing that species back would be. The plight of the passenger pigeon is both a dramatic story of extinction and a popular topic for de-extinction. In the 1700s, their numbers were estimated at 3 billion. But because their flocks were huge, they were easily hunted. By the 1920s, they were extinct. I think that uh, the passenger pigeon has been extinct for such a long time that the habitat that it lived in is probably gone. In the case of where something is very recently extinct or on the verge of extinction, it might be that the niche is still vacant. And by filling that vacated niche, we might stabilize the community and in doing so, actually save other species that might have gone extinct if that niche had been left vacant. Why should we preserve endangered species around the world? We have inherited the Earth from our ancestors. It's our responsibility to pass it on to our descendants. So what do you guys think? You know, this has been a hot topic in the ecological community for a while, and actually really controversial. You know, in some ways it's like a seed bank, you know, for security, but there's a lot of concern that if you're gonna bring something back, and if there's no proper habitat for that animal to live in, you know, what's the ethical boundary of that? That's, that's a major issue. Yeah, you know, people really oftentimes look at it from one perspective of can we bring this thing back to life, but there's so much more to it because they need a place to live after all. You know, if we just put it back in a zoo, that's just kind of like a bit of a show and tell, but it's not really doing anything for the world, you know? 
is their habitat restored enough? Is there no poaching there anymore that we can put them back in their place? The whole thing really feels like Jurassic Park or something. It does, but I think a lot of us scientists were kind of disappointed when we realized how quickly DNA degrades over time. Mm. So we're never going to be able to do it like they do it there, where they just kind of take the blood out of that mosquito and put it into another animal. It's just probably never going to happen. As we're filming, I always like to kind of document along the way. I'm sure you guys do the same. And this really stood out to me. So I posted this one on my Instagram, where above you could see that is the black rhino vial, and in there are black rhino cells. We looked under the microscope, and on the bottom, you can see those are cells that are growing. And they're going to freeze those and maybe turn them into an entire rhino someday. So you guys could be looking at the beginning of a rhino right there, and I just thought it was wow. definitely worth posting. Now, if you guys or anybody else out there want to check out our behind-the-scenes photos from the field, be sure to follow us on Instagram. Now, Shinny, you went to Tornado Alley. And it seems like the type of place where out of tragedy came innovation. Yes, yeah, sadly, lives have been lost in tornadoes, but it has uh, prompted the need for research to find out exactly how to make above ground shelters safe in a tornado. Let's check it out. On the west side of Burton, we have a major tornado coming down. Oh my God! May 20th, 2013. One of the worst tornadoes on record was captured in a time-lapse video that went viral. Here it is, Damon. Large tornado. We have this large debris in the air. Here it is, Damon, right in front of me. People in Westmore need to be underground on this tornado. We have debris, large, large chunks of debris. The entire nation watched as the storm took a direct hit on Plaza Towers Elementary School in Moore, Oklahoma, claiming the lives of seven children. By the time I got to the school, I still hadn't heard any word on Kyle. And from the looks of the school, I knew it wasn't looking good. Winds recorded at over 210 miles per hour, ripped through the school, knocking down walls and turning the playground into a pile of rubble. I think if you live in Tornado Alley, it needs to be a priority. You need to have a shelter. 300 miles from Moore, in a lab in Texas Tech University, engineers worked to make Mickey Davis's goal for storm shelters a reality. What we have here is a, uh, it's an air cannon. It's called Boomer. Virtual potato launcher on steroids. So you launch things straight at walls, is that? That's what right, you do here? yeah. Professor Larry Tanner does research on the effects of extreme winds and destruction caused by flying debris. Pictures I've seen of the damage after a tornado is all about impact. Where wind really becomes an issue is that the debris opens up the building envelope, the walls, the roof. Once you have that envelope open, now you've got double the trouble. The most predominant projectile that we see in these storms is normally something like a two by four. So what you tend to see coming out of this cannon is what you tend to see flying around when a tornado is spinning. Absolutely. We did a shelter research for the National Science Foundation back in May after the uh, Moore tornado, specifically just to look for shelters in the storm path. The question now is not whether to rebuild, but how. We're smart engineers. We know how to design for the wind speeds. And now we know how to design for impact resistance. Researchers performed tests on a variety of building materials. Some of them failed. Through trial and error, innovation came in the form of reinforcement and engineering. So should we uh, load, the, load, load the... Load the cannon? Load the cannon. OK, let's do it. <laughs> Wow. 103 miles an hour. 103? It's completely fine. This particular wall is what we call a double white brick. In other words, you've got one wall of brick here, another wall of brick here, and then there's a four inch cavity that's filled with concrete and reinforcing steel. This wall will totally resist the EF-5 missile. But this shows that you can have a safe place above ground. The beautiful thing about an above ground shelter is that it's a dual use space. So is that what you would advise a school like Plaza Towers? Absolutely. 
In the heart of Tornado Alley in Oklahoma City, Oakdale Elementary was hit twice. So we're relying on that testing that's done at Texas Tech to tell us what kind of construction will withstand those projectiles. Jeff Wegner and John Joyce design Oakdale's new safe room. We just adapt those standards and build to those. It has to support the load, not only of the, of the roof, but also uh, the pressure for a 250 mile per hour wind for an EF5 tornado. These walls are real thick. They were thickened to become a safe room. And they're These like are 12, 12, inches, 12 thick. inches thick. Another real important thing in a safe room is the connections, where the wall and the roof intersect. We have to do all these special connections because obviously you don't want that coming apart and the roof comes off and then the, the wall can fail and all these kind of terrible things that can happen. So is that where the innovation lies? It's two things. It's the forces pulling the building apart and it's keeping projectiles from coming through the walls. Kim said, I want just a structure that we can be confident that it's not gonna, not gonna fall in on these kids. How do you feel about having this? Um, I feel like we have a safer place to come than we did before. And in those times where we may have to have a safer place to bring our students, we have it. And that's the hope for schools like Oakdale and Plaza Towers, that by using innovative building techniques, they can keep their children and communities safe. So comfort aside, are the above ground shelters really more effective and functional? You know, they're, they're more effective because you don't know where a tornado is going to hit. Mm. So it's very expensive to develop an above ground shelter. Yeah. But then after spending all that money, you may not necessarily actually need to be protected because the tornado goes in a completely different direction. So it is important to build these shelters anyway because you're building schools. And so to reinforce them with this kind of technology seems really effective. Right, and it's a multi-purpose space. Exactly. Know? And that's why it's so needed because 60% of public schools in Oklahoma don't have shelters, um, yet it sits in Tornado Alley. That is crazy. Now, you're about to get up close and personal with the tornado, and I understand you actually get in one. Yes, I got into the Vortec, which is a simulator of tornadoes. So I actually got to be in an EF3 strength wind. Trust me, for a fluid <laughs> dynamicist, it was absolute heaven. I loved it. <laughs> Coming down right now, major tornado. Coming down, another tornado. Deadly tornado rushes toward the U.S. community of Oklahoma City. The two-mile-wide wind tunnel ripped through the state capitol on Monday. Oh, my God! That was the tragedy on the ground, but new innovations are being developed in the lab to protect against future disasters. We create tornado-like vortices. We create things that mimic the characteristics of tornado wind speed. James, professor of mechanical engineering, designed and built a tornado simulator called Vortec. A simulator like this allows us to repeatedly reproduce in a controlled fashion and try to understand what happens to structures. Tornado winds are rated on an EF scale, which is an indicator of the severity of a storm based on wind speed and debris impact. So this was designed to do mid-EF3, so on the scaling means about 150 miles per hour or less. Have you ever stood in the vortex? Oh, absolutely, all the time. Would you like to go? This is the bit I've been waiting for. I'll turn it on slow. Yeah, And then build it up. Build it up. OK, so you're going to leave me here on my own. You're good. At this point, I was wondering just how powerful an EF3 would be. Wow. Now I can just about imagine how terrifying a tornado can be. Through your research, you're hoping to be able to recommend how to reinforce building codes. That's correct. 
what we really want to do is be able to recommend building codes and practices that people should consider when building in areas that are prone to tornadoes. We had no way of knowing how severe a tornado can be. We heard that it was on the ground. It looked like it was going to be a bad one. Jimmy Fleming, public information officer for more public schools. Meteorologists that we have are doing a great job of being on the cutting edge on the technology that lets us predict the storms. In the reconstruction of Plaza Towers, how much innovation is being implemented to ensure safety? The main thing is the actual storm shelter itself. These particular storm shelter walls are solid concrete, still reinforced into the foundation and through the ceiling. If a tornado were to hit the building, the shelter is going to stand. Do you think this is going to save lives? I hope we never find out. Mickey Davis is the mother of Kyle Davis, one of the seven children who lost their lives at Plaza Towers. It was just something I've never experienced. We got around to the school, and it was very hard to look at the school that day. Because I had just taken, sorry. I had just taken them to school. And um, the school didn't look like what it did when I dropped them off on Friday. There were seven families searching for kids. I didn't find out until the next morning. It was 18 hours later. So Mickey, it's very soon after May 20th. So what do you want to do next? I want a shelter in every school. My goal is to protect every child in Oklahoma, not just more. Do you think you will achieve shelters in schools? Some days, you know, are harder to get up and fight for it, but Kyle wouldn't want that. We need shelters in every Oklahoma school. Kyle would want me to get up and fight and do all that I possibly can so that kids are protected in the future. We can't prevent tornadoes from hitting the ground, but innovations are helping us predict their movement and protect against their impact. In a town like Moore, the technologies combined with the resilience of the community will help them rebuild. is it to implement these changes? It's pretty costly. I mean, you're reinforcing walls and then reinforcing them again. I mean, these are really safe houses, so that costs money. But you can imagine the difference between the cost of if that school got destroyed and they had to build it up again or lives lost, you know, obviously there's quite an emotional cost with that. So it's a, it's a tricky balance. So hopefully they can start to look in the long term with these types of solutions. Yeah, I mean, once they establish the building codes, then it will become a bog standard way of building. That's not there yet, but this technology will certainly allow that to happen in the future. So watch this space. Well, thank you for sharing that, Shinny. I mean, we were both in some very interesting labs and met some very passionate researchers this week, and we'll be sure to bring you more stories like that here on Techno next time. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, and more.